Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you for giving me the time. Um, as Kevin's already alluded to, it's not really a sexy subject, um, but uh, it is a subject that as a golf course manager you'll probably all have to deal with in your time, and it can be very tricky um, going forward. Uh, the first thing I would say is green keepers never have enough machinery. So it doesn't matter how many times you ask them do they need a machine or do you want a replacement, they will always 100% say yes. Um, so that's the first thing that I noticed when I changed from PGA uh, Pro into, into the club management side. Um, what problems does that bring? Well, if the course manager or my course manager had his way, we would stock bank every piece of machinery he could. So we'd end up with 100 pieces of kit with six or seven staff to, to use them day in, day out. Just not practical, and in, in this day and age, it's certainly not economical to, to do that. Um, the other thing I will say is this, what I go on about today, I understand doesn't fit all clubs. Um, but I've tried to come up with a system that works for, it certainly worked for me and, and three different clubs, three different parts of the world, and I've now negotiated four replace, full replacement programs. So it can be tailored, obviously, to your individual club, but um, this is my experience uh, rather than uh, um, me standing up and saying it fits, fits all clubs. Um, the first thing that I tried to do was, was to make it a team effort. Um, and make the, the, the process a planned process rather than me just going to my course manager and saying what machine do you want us to replace next year? Um, if it was up to the greenkeeper, he would have full control of that and he would go to his favourite salesman and so on and he would just buy whatever machine he, would, uh, he wanted and whatever colour that machine may be and that would be the end of the process. It would take about two and a half minutes. Um, from my point of view, just to give you an indication, my last uh, machinery replacement program took me six months. Purely and simply because we looked at the whole thing, got the team involved, as I say. But the reason I get the team involved is twofold. One, I took the, I took the decision making process away from the course manager. He had input as, as he should have, but the decision making process was no longer his and solely his. Um, so we got him and his entire team involved, everybody from the mechanic, the apprentice, all the qualified greenkeepers. They were all involved in the trialing of every machine we had, um, giving us feedback, giving us some information about how and what the, the good and bad points of each machine and each manufacturer was as well. Um, so that was the reason we got the team involved and we got the team involved at the process stage rather than down the line because it was more important to me to hear their feedback before we took the next, the next stage. The next stage of that was to be clear on how we funded the process. These pieces of kit we're buying or, or leasing, whatever that your club do, um, they're, they're hugely expensive and can be very, very expensive to maintain, which is one of the things that I noticed the greenkeepers never really counted on going forward. They, they, they factored in the cost of the machine to buy over a period of time, but they'd never counted how much maintenance they would uptake if there was a breakdown, if it got past the warranty, and so on and so on. So one of the things that we, we tried to do was to explore the funding options and, and make sure that we understood clearly how we were going to fund the process before we started speaking to um, all the manufacturing companies. That was board discussions, me looking at the funding options available, looking at our bank balance, looking at how many years we could uh, do the process over and so on. So it was very much a case of taking a look at everything um, involved in that funding process and then trying to, to move forward from there. Making the process and the tender process open and transparent is essential in my opinion. Far too many people go into, or far too many people in my experience go into these things already with an idea of who they're going to buy from, what they're going to buy, what the salesman um, is going to get out of that and so on. Um, for instance, me making the, the uh, tender process open and uh, transparent to all, we agreed the scope of machinery that we were going to buy. 
We also agreed the scope of machinery that we were going to trade in, and we sent an identical letter to the three main suppliers, um, Toro, Ransoms, Jacobson, and John Deere. On that letter, gave them a very detailed brief of the time scale that I wanted their tenders back to, who the tenders had to come back to, and more importantly, to make sure that they didn't use any of their salesman's influence on my green staff during that tender process to influence their decision-making process. So it was very, very clear at the outset before they um, started speaking to us what I expected, what I was looking for, and what not to do as the case may be in, uh, in this case. The reason I do that is because um, some of the managers have been in post a lot longer than me, and they may have come up against similar situations. At one of my previous clubs, I openly caught one of my course managers bending the rules, shall we say, with one of the supplier, machinery suppliers. So we paid a certain amount. He managed to get lovely holidays all around the world, and the club got no discount. So that experience has, has led me to be potentially a little bit ruthless towards my course manager and the, and the companies dealing with this, but it has stood me in good stead, um, and it's a valuable lesson that I'm sure I'll, I'll never learn, I'll never forget, should I say. Um, I find this so, quite weird when I got into the, the management side, that when we did a tender process in my first role as management, uh, my course manager only spoke to one of the, the companies. Now, I now realize why he spoke to one of the companies, but because um, his friend was the rep and he's company was the preferred machinery and so on. Um, during that process, I, I still explained to him, and potentially this is because I, I used to have my own shop and deal with reps and so on from the, from the Golf Pro side, but even if I wanted to buy John Deere, and I knew I wanted to buy John Deere, I would still put it to the open market to, to see if we get competitive quotes. And by doing that, not only does it keep John Deere on their tours, but it also gives the other two companies um, an opportunity to convince me um, and my, uh, my board that they were the right company to go with. So it, it's all about the business element and not what you're going to produce on the, on the golf course and the course manager is going to do at this time. Um, that's the way that I approached it. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the course manager was not involved in the negotiation and the tender processing but it was very much a case of I met with uh, either the sales director or the company owner of these three companies to make sure that they knew what we were after. I got a face-to-face. -face. I got a much, much better feel for how they did business uh, by meeting them face-to-face. -face. Nine times out of ten, I always try to make sure that the meeting is held in my boardroom or my office rather than go to their ground. It brings them to, to me and it's Again, it's a bit of an old school PGA trick that you always used to get them in your back shop and see how rubbish you were doing during that winter period to try to screw them down a little bit. So it's, it's things like that that you learn as you go along, and I think that's one of the reasons why I try to put a process in place and the same process I've used for all the deals that I've, I've done in the future. Um, when we've met the the companies face to face and we've got the tenders back, this is where I bring back in my course manager. We analyze the tenders uh, from the financial aspect. We also analyze the tenders from the point of view of what machine he thinks is best for that job. So if I'm replacing 10 machines, it might be greens machines, fairy machines, surrounds, um, a, a holocor or whatever that machine may be, we have to analyze the machine's performance against what that company is doing because ultimately we need to make sure that not only is the best financial decision for the club, but it is the best decision for the golf course and the, and the uh, course manager and his team to present uh, uh, the course and how, how we want. So it's very much a case of trying to get everybody involved at this stage who are going to be working with it the last thing probably in the process I do as far as the, the tenders is present to the board. Now, uh, I've said present recommendations to the board. I don't give all three tenders to the board. Uh, that would be absolute suicide in my um, past history. I give them recommendations. 
explain the process, explain why we're going to do it, and explain who's been involved in that process. Touch wood, um, they've always taken uh, my recommendations on board without too much inquiry and certainly not without going back to the, the companies to dispute anything. So it's, it's, a, it's a recommendation I present to the board, not the, the full tenders. And then finalize the deal. The reason I put this in is because it's the same as anything. In black and white, the deal can sometimes be slightly different to what, what you were discussing with. So it makes sure the tenders, the contracts, the promotion elements and so on are all involved in that uh, final deal. So we finalize the deal with our preferred supplier before we go back to the unsuccessful suppliers to say, sorry, but uh, we'll maybe look at it again in four or five years' time. So it's just that finalizing the deal to make sure that every um, dot, uh, eh, T is crossed and so on. Um, the last thing is where we get the happy team. Now, the happy team is the greenkeeper's got a load of new machinery, he's happy, we've gone through the process. Um, my experience is if I can get my team happy and he's, I'm giving him the best equipment to do his job properly, I then get the best out of him and his team, which ultimately keeps my members happy uh, going forward. So it's a process that I've stuck to. It's worked for me. Um, by no means am I saying that it works for every single one of you. So, but it is a process that certainly works. And that's, um, that's certainly the conclusion that I've come up with, that set the process in place go through the stages of the process and make that final decision, but take your time to do so. Okay, that's me. I worked out, just to give you a ballpark figuring, um, that, and we did this when, when I do it. I do a bronze, silver, and gold package. That's what I challenge my green staff to do, my course manager to do. Obviously, bronze is what's essential. Silver is just the, the nice to have. So in the silver, he's got a mini excavator and a, hand, uh, a clegg hammer and things like that that are not essential. And then the gold is things like a cherry picker, a drone, and fairway brush, and all, all, these, all these nice to haves that the resorts may have. But if I was to start a golf course today of 18 holes, my size, um, I'd, I'd look at initial spend of at least, the very least, to open the doors of £500,000 on machines alone. Um, so the, they are a very, very expensive piece of kit. And also, they're, if they're not looked after properly, they're very, very expensive to repair during the time that they have a shelf life, because they do ultimately have a shelf life. 